Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we will be watching Caesar vs. Ariovistus by Historia Civilis. So, this is another video focused on Caesar by Historia Civilis. Uh, I'm excited to continue his campaigns in Gaul. Um, I'd ask you guys to please check out the Patreon, where I have uh, exclusive reactions to Historia Civilis videos. Anyway, let's jump right into this one. Shortly after Caesar's victory over the Helvetii, he received mm. a barrage of messages from Gallic tribes, thanking him for dealing with the invaders and congratulating him on his victory. They then asked if they could come and see him in person. It was all quite mysterious, and they insisted that everybody take an oath of secrecy before the meeting. Wow. Once face to face, they told Caesar about a German king named Ariovistus. Apparently, Ariovistus had been invited across the Rhine by some Gallic tribe to intervene in a dispute, and had just started to gobble up territory for himself. He then began to bring large numbers of Germans across the Rhine in an effort to colonize his new territory. He now had 120,000 Germans living in Gaul, with plans to bring more. Wow. So at this point, you know, Rome is sort of slowly getting into... Gallic territory. Um, you know, Gaul is becoming less of the unknown, but Germany, <laughs> the German lands, are very much the unknown, and they will, uh, for a while, be a threat to Roman security. They're always worried about the Germans, the Germans uh, invading. Um, and that will continue after, uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> Rome will conquer uh, Gaul, and it will, you know, no longer be so unknown. And then, I mean, that's what's happening at this point. So, you know, we're sort of seeing this dynamic uh, with the, the German threat to the Gauls and to the Romans. As a cherry on top, Ariovistus had also attacked Rome's closest ally in Gaul and had forced them to disavow their treaty with the Romans and uh -oh. to provide an annual tribute to Ariovistus instead. Nobody in Gaul was happy about this. The Gauls then got to the point of this secret meeting. They formally asked Caesar to intervene on their behalf. Caesar agreed to meet with Ariovistus to see if he could get him to moderate his behavior. I don't want to make it sound like Caesar was doing this for altruistic reasons. A <laughs> law had been passed in 61 BCE instructing all governors of Transalpine Gaul to protect Rome's Gallic allies whenever they were able. In other words, Caesar had a mandate from Rome to act on this if he wanted to. But even more to the point, Ariovistus was encroaching on Rome's mm -hmm. sphere of influence, and doing nothing in response would do some real damage to Rome's credibility in the region. Yeah, you know, Caesar has to protect Rome's image. Um, you know, the Romans have to show that they are the you know major power around here, and they can't have that challenged by some German king. In addition, I mean, Caesar is a man who sees opportunity. You know, perhaps... Uh, I don't know if he already does, but perhaps he sees an opportunity to expand Roman influence even further. Caesar sent a message to Ariovistus, asking for a meeting on neutral ground. Ariovistus wrote back, saying, no, if you want to meet, come to me. <laughs> Obviously, negotiations were off to a great start. <laughs> Caesar sent a second message, reminding Ariovistus that Caesar had been the one to legitimize his rise to power during his year as consul. This was a not-so-veiled threat. He was saying, I made you. I could easily unmake you. Wow. Caesar then listed his demands. First, he instructed Ariovistus to immediately stop bringing Germans across the Rhine. Second, he instructed him to return all of his Gallic hostages. Third, he told him to immediately cease all military activity. Ariovistus sent a simple reply. He said that the Romans were free to run their conquests as they saw fit, and so was he. <laughs> Cheeky. Yeah. Around the same time, Caesar also received two pieces of intelligence. First, he got word that Ariovistus had mobilized an army and was marching on his neighbors again. Second, he started to get reports of hundreds of thousands of Germans on the other side of the Rhine, preparing for a crossing. This was getting serious. Caesar gathered his men and set off towards Ariovistus. On the march, he got word that the German army was moving towards a town called Byzantio. This was bad. Mm -hmm. This town was well fortified, and Caesar wasn't interested in continuing negotiations with a guy behind strong walls, much less conducting a siege if it came to that. He left his supply wagons behind, 
and pushed his men forward at a breakneck pace, marching all day and all night, and arriving in Vesantio just before the Germans could reach it. I don't know if those are coming to play, um, perhaps not. Um, but, you know, we talked about supplies last time and how it was really important to keep up supplies uh, and how it was difficult to keep up your supplies in uh, enemy territory, which this still basically is. So, you know, leaving supply wagons behind to rush ahead is definitely a risky move in this situation. He stayed there for several days, allowing his men to rest while his supply wagons caught up seems to have paid off in this situation. When he was ready, Caesar marched out and closed in with Ariovistus's army. He sent messengers to set up a face-to-face -face meeting. Ariovistus had some specific ground rules for the meeting. He asked that exactly 10 men on horseback accompany each general. Caesar had cavalry, but they all happened to be Gauls. So <laughs> fearing some sort of trap or betrayal, he had some of his most loyal infantry mounted on Gallic horses. Yeah, the Romans would not work out cavalry, cavalry for a long time. Um, you know, they would rely on, you know, foreign allies to be their cavalry um, for quite a while. Though they would eventually uh, work it out, but not at this point. This led to some of his men joking that he was treating them so well that he made them into equite. If you don't get the joke, it's a pun. Equite means both horsemen and a wealthy Roman. So the two generals and their retinues met on an open field. Caesar simply reiterated what he had told Ariovistus in his letter. He demanded that no more Germans cross the Rhine, that the Gallic hostages be returned, and the cessation of all military activities. Ariovistus said that this was now his province, just as Transalpine Gaul was Caesar's province. He said that he and the Romans had won their respective provinces through conquest, fair and square. Ariovistus then leveled a threat, saying that many politicians back in Rome would probably be overjoyed if he killed Caesar right now. Mm. Damn. This it's a threat, and it's a threat that shows that Ariovistus has a bit of knowledge. You know, he knows to a certain extent what's going on in Rome. Uh, he knows that uh, Caesar is a very controversial figure and is quite disliked by many of the prominent politicians of Rome. So, you know, it's a, it's a good threat, and it's one that sort of shows his hand a little bit, like, you know, I know what I'm doing. This comment caused a fight to break out between the horses. Oh, wow. Caesar would say that the Germans started it, but he would say that, wouldn't he? Of course. Caesar immediately broke off negotiations and had his men return to camp. A few days later, Ariovistus sent another message, saying that he was interested in another meeting. Caesar was understandably suspicious, considering how the last one ended. He sent his favorite Gallic interpreter to go and see what Ariovistus wanted. Mm. It's a good thing he did, because in fact it was a trap. Ariovistus took Caesar's interpreter prisoner, and would spend the next several days arguing with his religious advisors over whether or not they should burn him alive as a religious <laughs> sacrifice. Jeez. Yeah, Ariovistus does not seem like the kind of guy to play around. Uh, Caesar was very much right to suspect a trap. Um, it's not really surprising, you know. Ariovistus wants to win this conflict, whatever it takes. Ariovistus mobilized his army, and in a surprise move, marched all the way around Caesar's position and encamped oh. on a hill behind him. This nice. put him in a good position to intercept Caesar's grain shipments. Not great for Caesar. Mm -hmm. Ariovistus was leading an army of around 30,000, and Caesar had somewhere around 25,000. Caesar and Ariovistus both deployed for battle five days in a row. There was the occasional cavalry skirmish, but no outright attack. Caesar was now under pressure to attack before he ran out of food. And Once again, I mentioned it earlier in this video and in the last one, Supplies are coming into it. Ariovistus has intelligently cut off Caesar's supply line, and that is, you know, going to force Caesar to do something. So, you know, the supplies and supply lines are really important in, well, I mean, much warfare throughout history, but also in this situation. And with Ariovistus holding the high ground, this was a recipe for disaster. So Caesar came up with a plan. He marched his army out of his camp in three columns, leaving a small garrison behind. He then marched just beyond the German hill. 
Ariovistus saw what he was doing and sent out his cavalry and half of his infantry in response. Why only half? We'll get to that in a minute. Caesar had expected a German response, which is why he had his men in three columns rather than one. He instructed two columns to turn and hold the Germans off, while the third one began to construct a fortified encampment. Uh. There was some skirmishing back and forth, but Ariovistus never really pushed in a coordinated attack, even though the Romans were out in the open and undeniably vulnerable. When the third line completed its construction, the Romans pulled back and the Germans didn't pursue. Caesar was now in a position where he could intercept his food shipments unmolested, which meant nice. that he could take his time figuring out how to deal with Ariovistus. The next day was pretty uneventful, but late in the day, the Germans sent a raiding party to attack the first Roman camp, but Caesar had left a garrison and they were easily repulsed. During this engagement, some German prisoners were captured. Under questioning, they revealed that Ariovistus had been told by his religious advisors that victory was impossible until the next full moon. So this is another interesting feature of uh, you know, military conflict in the past, um, particularly in the, the, the far past. Um, you know, in the, our modern era is rather secular. We don't tend to make military decisions based on um, our religious convictions. And it's been like that for, you know, a bit now. Um, I, hard to say exactly when, but, you know, a couple hundred years. Um, when we look a little further back than that, um, you know, we can look at ancient times or medieval times. Of course, uh, Christianity was a big part of military conflict. You encounter factors like this, which, you know, we would obviously not uh, recognize some religious advisor telling us, well, you can't win till the next full moon. You know, we would attack when it was most convenient. But this sort of belief plays a factor. Um, and, you know, it's sort of an, an interesting thing to look at. And to us, we might be saying, like, what are you doing, Ariovistus? You're wasting a good opportunity to, uh, to attack. You know, you could have done more. But, you know, if that's your firmly held belief, if that's your religious belief, then that's as important to you in many cases as other objective factors such as positioning and timing. Um, alongside those, you have to put religious omens. You know, they have to be right, or it's going to all go bad for you. Aha! That explains why he was being so cautious. Caesar decided to take full advantage of this. The next day, he marched his army straight up the hill, and Ariovistus did not challenge him. Wow. Now both armies were on the hill. Caesar <laughs> then deployed for battle, so close to the German camp that they had no choice but to fight. If you remember back to when Caesar fought the Helvetii, he had kept his two inexperienced legions in reserve at all times. Here, for the first time, he put them up front, which is a sign of their growing competence. Mm. As Ariovistus' army prepared for battle, Caesar observed that the Germans on the Roman right looked a little weak. That's where he positioned himself, and that's where he intended to win the battle. All of a sudden, the Germans attacked with amazing speed. It all happened so fast that the Romans didn't even have time to throw their javelins. They just wow. had to drop them where they stood. Caesar ordered his first two lines forward and kept his third in reserve. Ariovistus fought with some pretty unusual tactics, which are worth getting into here. His infantry and cavalry coordinated very closely and were organized in mixed groups of 100. The infantry acted as a solid wall, similar to a phalanx while the cavalry would hide behind them and launch hit-and-run attacks, coming back huh. to regroup when needed. Each group acted independently, which meant that there were hundreds of hits and runs going on at the same time. It was extremely frustrating to deal with. As the battle dragged on, the Roman frustration started to show. I mean, that's got to make your army fairly dynamic, you know, able to operate very quickly. Though... I imagine it may also make it difficult to organize or control since you have so many of these small units sort of operating with a certain level of independence. So, you know, pros and cons. But in a, you know, sort of face-to-face -face battle like this, I can imagine that might be difficult to deal with for the Romans. 
Some dealt with the German walls of infantry by throwing themselves into them and ripping away the enemy's shields with their bare hands. Wow. <laughs> I ain't never seen that in a movie. Yeah. After some effort, Caesar was able to break through on the Roman right, just as he had planned. But with all of his attention devoted here, he was unaware that at the same moment, the Roman left was beginning to crumble. Uh-oh. The commander of the Roman cavalry, Publius Licinius Crassus, son of Caesar's political ally, uh. saw what was happening and launched into action. On his own accord, he went to the Roman third line, who were totally oblivious, and ordered them to come and reinforce the Roman left. Okay. The third line got there just in time, and the left held. This was an early example of the growing initiative of Caesar's subordinates, which would turn out to be a feature of the Gallic Wars. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, there's sort of uh, questions about how much initiative do you want your subordinates to take? Because on one level, you want to have control over your men uh, and your forces. But on the other hand, you can't be everywhere at once. Sometimes you want your subordinates to act independently. You know, I think... Basically, it, the thinking is if you have talented, competent, competent subordinates who are of the same mind as you and have the same goals and you know respect you as a leader, you want to give them a certain level of independence because you know that they're going to act intelligently and they're going to act in a way that you would approve of. Uh, if that's not the case, if you don't have faith in your subordinates, well, you've got some other issues, but you also don't want them acting independently because they're going to do things that you would not approve or go against your wishes or, or whatever. But this is an example of, you know, one of Caesar's subordinates taking the initiative and it works out because, you know, clearly he was a competent leader. Soon afterwards, the German collapse on the right reverberated throughout the entire army. The Germans mm. fell apart and fled. They continued their retreat all the way back across the Rhine, pursued wow. by a horde of angry Gauls. <laughs> Those hundreds of thousands of Germans waiting to cross the Rhine heard news of this defeat and went home. Mm. As luck would have it, after the battle, Caesar's favorite Gallic interpreter was found alive, but traumatized by the constant conversations about being burned alive. Poor guy. Caesar would later say that discovering that he was alive gave him as much pleasure as the victory itself. Oh, well, that's nice. <laughs> With these back-to-back -back victories over first the Helveti and then Ariovistus, Caesar would later say that he won two wars in a single summer. Rome was now well-established as an indispensable power broker in the region. Mm. Caesar left his army in Gaul under the command of Labinus for the winter and returned to his provinces to tend to his duties as governor. He'd be back next spring. Oh, yeah. All right. That was a good video. Uh, that was an entertaining one. You know, we were, we are going to see more of Caesar in Gaul, uh, more of his conquests coming up soon on Historia Civilis. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, please leave a like, subscribe, check out the Patreon. I hope you guys tune in for more reactions. Uh, you know, like I said, we'll be doing more reactions to Historia Civilis' videos on uh, Caesar and the rest of his videos. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this one. Uh, hope you guys are all having a good day, and I will see you again next time. Goodbye.